Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. If you're passionate about the tactical skirmish game that brings together strategy, lore, and creativity, you are in the right place. Don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe, and stay updated with our latest episodes. If you want to support the show, check out our Patreon. Your support means a lot to us. Follow us by using the social media links in the podcast description for all the latest news, and be sure to leave a review to let us know what you think. Thanks for tuning in. Here's today's episode. We're visiting Beijing which for the first time. A Chinese <laughs> guest on Just Another Kill Team podcast. We hit up we hit up Japan a while back, but this time we've got uh, an actual non like uh, non American or non non UK person who's actually into Kill Team. Joe, thanks for coming on to Just Another Kill Team podcast. And we're very interested to see how the kill team scene is cropping up in the Beijing area. Because it sounds like you've had some experience coming from other GW games. So I'm just kind of curious, like, tell us a little bit about coming up in the Games Workshop space in Beijing. Yeah, uh, very glad to get the invitation from the podcast. So actually, that's the first time I do the English podcast. Uh, also, be have been a um, Chinese uh, content creator for quite a long time. So... Yeah, uh, what aspect would you like to start with to, for the introduction or for me or the local community? I think a lot of the times it's fun to get a little bit of perspective on how you got into the hobby, like what edition you started playing in. Like, for example, a lot of the times when I first started doing podcasting stuff, a lot of people were curious about when I started playing 40K. I started playing like fourth edition, played Tau, and now I'm somehow trapped in the kill team space, enjoying my time watching elites stomp all over everybody in the meta. Jason has traveled all the way across the 40K verse from a couple of editions. So it's kind of interesting to see where people's journeys are in Games Workshop games. Okay, okay. So so it's a quite long journey. I started with the uh, release of 5th edition. I think that's the Assault on Black Beach. And during that period, I was a junior school student, so a really long time ago. And uh, start to play from fifth edition to sixth edition, which was a chaos, and then go to seventh edition. Uh, and I went to college to UK, so that's where I stopped playing uh, GW's game for a while uh, due to uh, the college uh, life was so intense that I have no time to paint me <laughs> and go to the local uh, game store, uh, which is uh, such a pretty. So if I uh, think about the the thing about, thing about the experience in the past. So actually, I come back to I came back to uh, GW's games uh, just this year from the Age of Sigmar 4.0. Uh, we tried that during uh, 2018. That was the first edition, so not well balanced. And um, I and my community switched to other games from like uh, FFG or AMG. Uh, or the Song of Ice and Fire for a while, and and things that didn't go well for the recent years due to the uh, short of supply or the rule issue. So we have spent as our local game store's owner retired. So actually, I was a player, and now he uh, I take his legacy to establish my own local game store, uh, which is now. Uh, non-profitable and <laughs> actually we survive based on a uh, player's do donation. And now we can go back to GW's games to play several Age of Sigma and people get many new players join the community back and uh, for the Strip and all Q team, I think it's a great start for uh, get a, uh, a science fiction product line for the local games club. And surprisingly, there are so many players uh, attending the uh, tutorial session, the tournament, and things are looking great. So, yeah, actually, G GW is uh, Games Workshop is <laughs> actually the best work world game after running around for different different games. So, yeah, so it's a, such a journey. Yeah, how often do you have tutorial games? Um, so it, actually, we have our uh, own. Um, it's kind of it's, it can be a methodology, but we have our own ways to 
to do that because the game club is based in Beijing, and I have to travel across the country or some or around the world to to my uh, full time job. So we uh, I leverage several uh, key players. We I would call them like the point of contact or POC. I leverage their expertise in different war games. I uh, do the tutorial to them, like three or four games. After that, they can escalate down to each of the new new players. So, uh, I think in the week before last week, we create a tutorial session for majority for the key POCs and also for, for new joiners. So there were like eight to ten uh, players attending that. So that is a good beginning. And for this week weekend, we will have our first uh, tournament with eight players. That's my was my plan, and I have. Underestimate the number of players who are interested to attend the tournament. So I have to hold another one on Sunday. So I will attend both of them. So there will be roughly 16 players uh, who will have some tournament experience for Super Bowl. And that is a great start. Uh, yeah. That is a great start. So Kill Team 3. Point, basically, third edition Kill Team has been a big push for your scene to get growing then. So was there a lot of Kill Team 2 floating around in Chinese play spaces? Or it sounds like you picked up your game store and then now you're rediscovering that Games Workshop moves a lot of product in real time, even though you flirted with some of the other game systems. How how was the old edition of Kill Team received in China from your perspective? Yeah, I, I will start with my personal perspective first. So uh, I have played the uh, first edition of Kill Team just once. And the player, maybe it's due to the issue of the uh, player who introduced the tutorial, we didn't enjoy that much. Uh, but during that time, the majority are all uh, the uh, factions from the 40K. Uh, but for 2.0, uh, the major, major issue is coming from the complexity. So uh, what uh, for the rules, um, the, in China, the Games Workshop China do have the translated rules, but they are only uh, sold in hard copies, and the majority of them are combined with, with the box set. So it's quite difficult to get the localized rules. And uh, in another aspect, although uh, the, uh, what's the name? The uh, Wahapedia do have the uh, 2021 version of the rules, but I tried several times, and I felt difficult to get started with. There's a long section of, it seems like a long library, and there are 50 factions. And that means we need to start do the translation by ourselves. And that is a kind of insane to have such big investment. So uh, during that period, I, I think for the whole China-wise, there are like at least two, two several thousand players who have interested in Q-Team, because I know there is a big uh, kind of like a Discord group, there are at least 2,000 players there. Some of them are not talk very talkative, but uh, that is showing a big player basis. But they are majority of them are play for fun. So the only big tournament I know in China was in uh, September. So the major reason is that the Games Workshop China gives several opportunities to attend the, the global event by uh, giving away the go golden tickets. So only one store, I think, in Shenzhen, they they are the biggest, uh, one of the biggest uh, 40k organizers in in the in the country, and they hold a like a ten player tournament, and one of the player will get the uh, already get the golden ticket will go to Atlanta, I think, for the uh, championship. That that is a top start, but for three point all, uh, as oh, personally, I figure out the although the balance is is. Sucks in the in initially, but for the uh, circle, uh, the tournament will be super interesting to hold and to, yeah. Uh, just I'm here just also to learn the insight from you guys too. Then we can hold more tournaments in the in the whole country. Yeah, hope to see more Chinese players can attend the global event uh, with more golden tickets. Yeah, so I didn't even know that China already had a golden ticket for this year. So it'll be cool. Me, me and Jason, if you know that player, you know, have them make sure to come by and swing by and say hi to us because Jason and I will be there in our respective capacities. So, and I'm sure that he'll bring a lot of learning back to China because I'm sure that this is definitely one of the spots where there probably is going to be a play gap between how 
the rest of the world is playing versus the translation because it sounds like GW has just started translating things into Chinese? Or is it all a fan, fan translation still? It's translation by myself. Oh, <laughs> okay. Our, yeah, actually, the, I can show you on the screen. So I'm sorry. I don't either. So, so Joe, uh, you've just been you've just been manually translating the whole thing for everybody. Yeah, oh my god, you got extra all, cards too. Dang, that's so actually cool. cards, the rules, um, the box arts are all translated in Chinese, but there are so many mistakes due to ignorance, as I have to say. So my job, because I was the translator of X Wing, uh, Legion, uh, several uh, Age of Sigma translators rules, have many. I am kind of. Uh, like I don't know the translation and <laughs> holding requirements. Yeah, so you you did like the official yeah. translations for those games? Yeah, yes. I, just... I just copy or scan the official translation and add it to them myself. Yeah. Uh, so that's what I'm doing currently. So I don't have time to uh, go through the translation again due to my full job. Mm -hmm. But I like I leverage like some like ChatGPT or the Google Translate or. I just screen out the mistake by GW and then correct them manually. Yeah, so I have already finished 10 factions up to now. So, uh, well, are going to, yeah, it's still a tough journey, uh, 20, 24 to go for now. So how, I'm actually, that's actually a really interesting point. So we, at the beginning of Kill Team, there were a lot of translation issues between different regions because obviously Games Workshop is an English brand first and not even just English English, that's more UK English where there's some eccentricities on how things are written compared to Americans. So there were translation issues at the beginning, but it sounds like you're struggling in that you are the translation bottleneck for a lot of China. Are there players that are mostly playing in English or is are most people in China that you know playing in Chinese right now? Because that's actually one of the things that I was the most curious about when we went to Japan. But Japan, it turned out, is mostly a community of expats that were playing Games Workshop games. Is that the case in Beijing right now or is it kind of like homegrown Chinese scene? So uh, it really depends. For, for the new players, especially players that are not super competitive, they will, they will just use the official translation, although there are mistakes. Well, for the mistake, I can give an example is that for the night lord, they have they can have the capability when they have the heavy uh, uh, clover, I think that's their faction rule. But in the translation, they translate that the light and heavy clover, and uh, there are some major mistakes like that, which is super unbalanced. But uh, also there are some small mistakes. So, but for a new player, they don't, just don't care and want to enjoy the enjoy the game. But for a competitive player, because I am the actual tournament organizer, uh, so that's my job to get the correct rules for my players who are doing the translation work. And for uh, many other competitive players around uh, the, the, the country, they will uh, check by themselves with the English rule. But as you know, it's not the first language, so there are many uh, misunderstandings or the difficulty due to the language issue. Uh, several times for some, so you can. That's why you can see me asking many questions in the Discord channel. So that's uh, the the difficult part. Yeah. So anyway, uh, I also in interesting issue I found in the Japanese version because we do have Chinese player in Japan. Japan, uh, the Games Workshop do print two part of taxes on the same area. <laughs> Japanese are in their core room. I can show you the screenshot later. So. Oh, so there's like yeah, a there, double print. Yeah, 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 so they, they can, cannot distinguish any of the Japanese characters. <laughs> That's so hilarious. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like, that sounds like that sounds like a lot of work as a single tournament organizer, and it's like a thankless job because me and Jason we get the benefit of at least everything is in English. So that when we run our tournaments, we have our this is the document, this is the English. We might argue about what raw is, but at least we are all on the same page. When it comes to the Chinese scene, it seems like maybe there's a little bit of wiggle room on either side, just because players have to know that there's an English document somewhere. For the casual players, maybe it doesn't matter because it's just kind of like a vibes based dice rolling game, which is good. Good, but for those more organized tournament players, they either have to go through you or they have to be native, somewhat native English speakers, which has got to be pretty hard in mainland China. Yeah, so especially, I, I do admit the uh, English rating in for Q team coming, compared to the Age of Sigma in the same, same period is not that great to even for native English speaker. And I can see many TOs 
for example, the New York Open or the so-called Open, they spend a lot of time to create their own FAQs to try to clarify things. So yeah, there's a whole, I believe that is a whole community effort. It's not only for the translator, but also the native TOs. Uh, yeah, well, things will get better, yeah. Yeah, generally GW in this edition and the last edition have done a pretty good job at responding to community questions and updating over time. And I'm sure that in the Chinese scene, it's no different. But I got to ask, you know, the most common question, what factions are the most popular in your region? I know that obviously elites have been very good for the edition so far. And I'm curious if the Chinese Chinese player base loves Space Marines as much as the rest of the world does. Yes, definitely. So, uh, oh. Every single player starts with the Space Marine, as you know. So we call them the the uh, fighter in the galaxy. So if I translate them directly. So nobody calls them actually Marine, just uh, like a space warrior. So that's what, what they call them. So, but for for majority of the player, one of the key attracting point for Q team is the uh, relatively uh, spending for this game. Because as you know, for even for American player, the 4K, uh, 2000 point army lost in for like $600 at least. So it's also a heavy burden for the local consumption level. So for Q team, I think majority will be interesting for with the Angel of Death because they are quite cheap based on the new starter set, thanks for the GW. And I believe for based on today's uh, Nurgle uh, Marines release, the uh, Hawk Marine will be also popular because the only there's no extra spurs needed for such building. And yeah, and for space running, yeah, they, they do are they are really the super popular uh, armies in my region. And I can see like uh, several players will use kind of deaths but then attend the tournament uh, in this weekend. Well, you're allowing them for this weekend's little intro tournament for the starter kit? Um, yeah, uh, because for the starter kit, uh, they are all sprues from the blend box, right? That's true. And in, uh, they are not out of stock for uh, in the past. So we, mm -hmm. so for the retailers, we can still order them, but in a relatively higher price. So just the starter box will also re get received in the local stores on Friday. So I think... We don't have enough time to pull them out from the <laughs> sprues and get them assembled, so, which is cool. Yeah. Are, is there a lot of buzz on your Discord about the new releases of the teams? I know right now it's very late for you. You know, me and Jason, we're in the bright early morning of November 6th, but for you, it's the end of the day. So has there been a little bit of a buzz from your Discord communities, or are people getting ready to go to bed and they will see it tomorrow? Yeah, they're super excited. So actually, I just do a live stream for um, the local YouTube. Yeah, as you know, there's no YouTube in the mm -hmm. channel. I just do a live streaming to describe the rules uh, by oral translation for the Pokemon Rain. And also, they released the Chinese version at the same time, which is great. And people are already talking about the build and the tactic for the tactics, which is suitable for the Pokemon Rain <laughs> tonight. So it will be an exciting night for, for tonight, and I hope to see great results in the tournament for the Pro Marines. Yeah, I assume Legionary and Phobos and Warp Coven are also doing reasonably well as far as player bases are concerned. Legionary being the old standard, and obviously if people already had those Plague Marines, they could have just been using them as Legionary this whole time. Yes, definitely. But actually for the local community, as they sometimes they misplay the rules and sometimes they do have the holistic view about the meta because the, I don't think, think there's a one city you can have all the factions uh, played around by different players. So there's no big tournament uh, yet like the US. So people's uh, point of view are uh, somehow biased by the uh, local meta. So people will just, but, but they do watch the uh, meta tier list video from YouTube and <laughs> discuss about why whether they buy in or not. So it will take some time to get them uh, aligned with the uh, tier list. But for the uh, elite teams, actually, people are yeah, people understanding are not the same. But probably the like uh, for which uh, mark of chaos is the best for the uh, legionary. I think the answer will be different. 
you you've been playing commandos as your like main team for it sounds like a little bit how have you been dealing with the power of the new elites because commandos historically have been very good at different times but right now astartes are basically one of their big checks and right now if it sounds like the chinese meta has a lot of elite players because they're very strong right now how have you been managing with the new commando rules you no longer have ap1 or pierce one but you do have a lot of boys that are reasonably tough and some good melee profiles how has that been for you because you're obviously one of the more experienced players have you found any tricks that have worked reasonably well over time yeah so to be really honest and clear that we don't have uh much play experience currently because the uh the new edition just got released and people are busy building uh the miniatures are actually the old uh, commando sprues take me like two weekends to fix their uh, mold lines and get them fully painted. So I play them uh, about uh, three times on the tables and one time they're facing the end of death. And I will, uh, to be honest, I got crashed with the end of death. <laughs> and uh, I, because that was my first experience for the Q team, because I also transit from Age of Sigmar, I thought, oh, I'm the charger, I should be the best for the combat. And I charge my uh, war boss with uh, full power to a lieutenant of Angel of Death with uh, full health, which <laughs> I will never do that ever again. And uh, my uh, half of my wood was uh, lost for a single power uh, power weapon, and my uh, I didn't hurt any wood for the lieutenant. So that that were lesson learned. And uh, I have to admit, there's no good tricks yet, but uh, I have seen many good videos for Commando on YouTube from the overseas community. And I, my wish is I can learn from the upcoming six games in this weekend in an intense way, so uh, there, will, there will be more understanding. So because Q Team is a game that needs so much experience, and for based on the experience, you can, also, you can only learn that from good players. And it's quite difficult to figure it out by yourself. So without watching the overseas battle report, uh, I thought that like in the first turn you should go to the engage order and shoot as much as possible, but which is not correct probably. And yeah, it's still a long journey to go for the tactics. Yeah, commandos definitely want to sneak up on people. Um, like you can yeah. you can throw your stun grenades from conceal orders, which is pretty good against elites. Um, you can charge with a conceal order, so that if you do have, like, maybe it takes two orc boys to bring down a, a space marine, but the one that does it can be concealed and hidden, and yeah, there's all sorts of tricks and tactics out there for... But yeah. it, it is a huge uphill battle to fight against space marines with non-space marines right now, for sure. To be yeah, fair, commandos do have one of the better tricks for actually interacting with the game right now, which is play Volkus, have your grot zip over to the opposite side, surveil your opponent, and just keep them alive yeah. for the whole game. It's a pretty solid strategy. You just got to make sure that you goad your opponent into doing stuff. So stun grenades from the boys early on, smoke grenades to stage, and a couple crack grenades floating around definitely are things that are pretty powerful. And then once your opponent tries to engage with you, you just zip over to the spot of the map that he's not on and valid target them and then score your nine points with the and surveillance tech up too hard on the rest of it yeah the surveillance tech up yeah so yeah especially for the tech ops it's another of a uh, level of complexity for especially for a new community mm -hmm. like, like mine so people are are uh basically intrinsically they all focus on the stats of uh operatives at the beginning stage and uh, to be honest, I don't see much players use grenade well, like like just what you just said. And then the compli compli complexity coming from the tag offs, the different kind of the uh uh what, what is called key ops or quit ops, yeah, mm -hmm. so, crit ops, tag ops, yep. Crit op, yeah. So uh yeah, so just as I said, there is need to be some insight from the overseas battle report or actually played as a good play overseas which will be super helpful for the local community to grow. And growth is definitely the most important thing when it comes to getting better at Kill Team. You can't get stuck and say, oh, this is unwinnable, because there's always something you can do better, even if the Commandos Elites matchup is particularly rough. You know, having the ability to know that you've got 
the grot to pressure your opponent is very important for overall game plans. And then having a plan to try to crack a couple models that you can open up a flank probably also makes sense. You've got the knob, you've got the rocket, you've got the bomb squig, and the suicidal bomb squig that your opponent isn't expecting still can do a lot of work, especially on the off chance if your six dice on fours doesn't actually kill your your bomb squig, which would be hilarious and very, very unlikely. Yeah, so that is the most hilarious rule have sitting on the kill team. It's really work. And I uh, hope to see that. I hope I can see that my bomb squeak, squeak can actually bomb someone for the upcoming tournament without being shoot to death on the midway. Yeah, yeah. just got to make sure. Just gotta make sure that you always keep him hidden behind stuff, fully obscured, like fully visibly obscured, which on focus is pretty easy. Yeah. So that's probably the fun thing on Volkus. And then making sure that when he's gonna go off that turn, you have Daka 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 up so that he's just way more reliable than if he didn't have that up. Yeah, yeah. I really should say, I know before you record, <laughs> I will watch it back and uh, to share more insight with my with my friend who play also play common laws. Thank you for that. Yeah, you could you could put the bomb squig inside of a Volkus stronghold behind a door so that he can't be seen from any angle. And then when it if so if an enemy walks out into a range that he threatens, he can run through the door and blow them up. And it's a good way to just kind of like if they never come into that area, it's good area denial. And if they do, you can blow them up and it's good damage. Wow. Thanks for that advice. Yeah, and actually because well, the reason why I didn't uh, put too much time thinking about the uh, commando tactics, one is that uh, I was focused on the translation. Another thing that holding a tournament as the uh, local, that were well, the only person want to hold that experience in my area is quite difficult. So that's why I try to uh, join as much Discord channel as I can to meet different kind of TOs because. It, as you know, this is a really high or intense information for a new tournament organizers to choose the correct layout, or sorry, correct kill teams, kill zones, and also the map and the mission. Uh, we don't want to choose the bad ones, like the uh, is that energy impulse or something called that. Our source, I think. <clears throat> yeah. Our source uh, and extraction are probably the more contentious missions of the current crit ops pack. Yeah. Yeah, but it's quite difficult for a new uh, TO to get all the knowledge as you do for who, who is an experienced, experienced player with uh, many TOs in your community. So everything needs to start from scratch and to get to... I already printed three sets of beta decima <laughs> and, uh, and choose to not use them for the upcoming tournament because I'm not sure how to control or manage the play. Uh, after I I tried them around, so there's so much to learn to hold such a uh, tournament compared to uh, other games. Like for Age of Sigma, you just hold the general handbook, roll some dice for choosing the mission, you'll be fine. Uh, but for Q team, there's so much to learn, and but it's good potential to groups. I, I do like that. Yeah, one of our friends, Can You Roll a Crit, released, recently released his map pack. So there's a map pack there for all the new stuff and the UTC MDF terrain from the WTC out of Spain. And then I believe that Turning Point Tactics from the UK also also has their own map packs. So there's a couple of community-made map packs, and I think Australia also has one. So there's a fair number of them floating around. Eventually, after you do them for a while, it's good to kind of dip your feet into making your own maps. But the good thing about Volcus right now is that it has pretty good maps. And the feedback that I've gotten from the New York Open as a TO is that Volcus has been broadly very, very positive. So the idea of just playing on Volcus with strongholds where visibility is pretty easy to cut, but there's not so many spots that are just fully in cover all the time where objectives are super important does mean that people generally have a good time because you have three different zones that you're fighting over. Each one of them can have two or three staging spots and counter staging spots. So there's a lot of hot spots and the hot spots are all pretty amusing. Thanks for the advice. So that's a so my investment actually works for the workers. I actually paid money to buy four sets of workers to give my community a full start. Uh, and yeah, uh, then I'm more satisfied. So I'll send them to get painted as I just watched some videos to say that, hey, you ask your players attend your tour GT tournament with fully painted. 
So that's a good reason to get all your terrain painted. So the rate is reasonable, but it will take some money and some time to get it, all, everything prepared. Yeah, I think the other cool thing is that you can work with your community to work, like paint them together. So as a burgeoning new scene, having everybody who comes in have a little bit of buy-in, so having a community painting day, I think for locally we're going to start up Trench Crusade, which is an offshoot of like the Mordheim variant of dice rolling games. We're going to have a little community day where the Mordheim group is getting together to paint up the trenches from 40k for the new game. So I think having those days where everybody's in one spot is really good. And those tournaments are also a good spot for that, where everybody can just be together in the same position and just be people and play the game a little bit. That's a really good advice, because my, my plan was to organize a, try to organize a GT tournament for two days, six rounds of Swiss round in January after I got enough experience for holding a uh, casual RTT. So <clears throat> there will definitely be a good uh, point to get everything painted. And actually, uh, because all the uh, Into the Darkness and the uh, Beta Decima uh, turn set uh, cannot be purchased from the Games, Work Games Workshop China, and it's too hard, too expensive to buy them overseas. So I just print, it, print them all from the uh, architecture. And just one of player volunteer to stick all the magnets for me. So we gave him the title for the land shaper. <laughs> so yeah, and that, that will be a uh, yeah. So this was still a community effort for for the for the terrain, especially. So that's a special point for QT, and I do I do like it. Yeah, and one common piece of advice that both me and Jason have heard over the last two years of doing this podcast from new TOs, especially in newer scenes, is the consistency matters. Being able to be there regularly and have people know that there's a community space for them to play at is super important, even when people don't show up. And that's, those are definitely the parts where it's hardest. But it sounds like you've got that in spades because you've been doing community organization and tr translationing for people who are playing a game that doesn't have a proper translation in some respects so maybe you've got that part of your soul already locked down yeah it's actually uh, quite different for for a uh, developed uh, developing or war gaming developing country so it's very easy to get exposure because there are not many content creators so if you spend some time on the content creation or the web editing sharing your thoughts about tactics or innovating the Q teams, you'll definitely get some traffic and spots uh, for the, uh, from online. And that will be a good starting point to grow the community. So, uh, so our community, based on the local game store, which is just two, six point, uh, times four tables on the basement, uh, we do have a online uh, channel and several Discord groups. And yeah, that's where we get started and things it's getting better. So we can, call, because there are five Warhammer clubs in Beijing, which is quite a lot, but the majority of them focusing on the Warhammer 40k. And as you know, Q-Team is not a profitable product line from a shop owner perspective. I, I think that will be, which will be the same for America. So, so if one tournament organizer can help the whole city to grow the community together, so it will be uh, such a relief for other club owners uh, to let their players get the game they want to play, and also that, that won't take too much uh, cost from each of the store. So we, we try to build an uh, alliance to get things smoother and hope the overseas insight can accelerate the progress. Yeah, I think Kill Team doesn't make quite as much as 40k does, but because it double dips a little bit into the 40k community and the Kill Team community, because some of the boxes go both ways, that does help a little bit. It is a little bit rough initially because it's the smaller product line, so per sale it's smaller than maybe something like 40k where someone comes in like, I want to drop an army. But with Kill Team, once people once you get the scene rolling, there are a lot of players that do just want to say, I'm going to play this team and this team and this team, so they buy a bunch of teams all in a row. Yeah, yeah. So that's I already see that it's coming. So like for even for players who don't have much experience on playing, they are really good at buying stuff. So you can see them buying lots of different teams. But for uh, right now, it's also a difficult period for local game store game uh, game stores globally to grow the community because there are too many. I think there are thirteen uh, 2.0 boxes are out of stock from Games Workshop, they just stopped the line. 
and they, we are waiting for them to continue uh, or repackage with them to get a new release, just like what uh, Games Workshop already done for the other teams. And for uh, like for the log trader, they can only um, from online. And there are many teams that the 40k players already have some uh, productions for like the Southern Suns or the Mechanicus. So, uh, but for local stores, uh, another challenge is that there are so many teams that came from the, I don't know what to say, this, uh, like splitting the existing battle force or other box set that people can, you know, on, on US, you can, in US, you can buy it on eBay for uh, Inquisition uh, Spruce coming from, came from the uh, older battle force. So it's another kind of impact for the local game store to operate such a line. Yeah, but I think things will get better as uh, GW refresh the whole line. Yeah, I think that is part of the reason why the classification project is even going in the first place is they realized having 50 some odd teams is probably not a maintainable business model on a global scale. So they are working on it and, you know, they're, they're releasing, I think it sounds like every two months, it feels like they're going to release or every like month, they'll release another chunk of those 33 teams. We're just now getting the Phobos Marine re-release, I think, and the Kasserkin coming out pretty soon. So those would be good. And Kasserkin double dip on the 40k side. So that'll be, that's good for local game stores in some respects. Yeah, yeah. That will be a big restart for games. So already many boxes are, uh, can be purchased. But, uh, you know, the price got increased a bit for the new package and the new <laughs> token sets. But anyway, uh, people will get used to the get used to the new price point. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, when it comes to what is the tournament set up like in China. Do you guys use ITC points? Are you using uh, Best Coast pairings? Is there an internal Chinese tournament organizer that's like homegrown that you guys use? I'm just kind of curious about the logistical side. Yeah, it's a difficult part. Uh, the first thing is that I do have the Best Coast pairing account, but uh, I oh, I think only 40k connect with the ITC or WT's ITC organization. So to be to be honest, I I have no idea how to get connected and how to get players points scored online. So probably I need mm -hmm. some, another session yeah. to get all the information I need uh, to get some help after we can hold a regular March uh, tournaments. Uh, so the uh, uh, at the start, we start we start scoring based on the notebook. You know, back into the X Wing days, they released a menu uh, with like how to paint the points for the Swiss rounds. And uh, I even do the manual counting for the player strengths uh, by a calculator on my phone. So that was a really <laughs> rough beginning. And I, uh, but as you know, for the basketball pairing, you need to register all the players. And I only trained once. And I don't think that is very convenient for uh, a, a tournament to less than eight people. Because for eight people, we can just use some easy matchmaking uh, based on the win laws and the uh, VPs or the relative the uh, relative strengths for the VP. So that will be an easy way to do the for the next weekend. But for the larger event, definitely we'll try to use the IT, ITC or the basketball pairing for uh, help the pairing system. But uh, to be honest, for the Q team. As uh, Age of Sigma at least have a pairing system uh, published by Games Workshop themselves already. That is, is super complex for me. But I didn't see a clear uh, ranking tournament organization uh, organizing ranking system published by GW themselves. So uh, yeah, I, and that's one, another point I need some insight from the uh, global community to tell me how to how things work behind the best cost pairing. So I can explain to my players why your ranking is higher or lower. So that's the reason why I, don't, why I choose to not use the system for the upcoming weekend. Yeah, I think all of those things are super important for getting a scene organized. I think early on, I probably wouldn't really care about BCP or ITC. You know, if there's only one golden ticket and you guys have one big tournament, as long as it gets awarded, it doesn't matter if it shows up on ITC at all. All that matters is players have fun. And if players have fun, they'll keep coming back. Because at the end of the day, 
the core thing about this version of 40k kill team is that it is just a fun game like rolling dice watching your marines chuck bolter shots at opponents even if the plague marines seem kind of nasty with it yeah you know like those those moments are a big reason for why you even do this in the first place you know these hobbies are crazy expensive getting your friends out going to hobbies going to tournaments you know jason doing the surprise phobos run at the new york open going undefeated until he ran into warp coven that's why you're playing the game not not itc points like itc points are there but you can deal with that whenever you want like work on get, making sure that everybody has fun in the scene first and the rest of it will follow yeah it's a kind of like the pyramid so uh there will definitely be super competitive players or players of good as uh, several factions like jason and uh but the for for me the key is to grow the pyramid from the bottom up after you have enough uh enough player get uh recognize the or they know there's a uh game called kill him then drag their interest and have make them to assemble their minis that have uh fully with ash on their shelf and come to the store play the game go to tournament so the it's a kind of like a funnel. The number of player will get reduced bit a bit, but uh, as always, the key point is to grow it from the bottom up of the pyramid. Then will be yeah. I think for after one probably not one year after two or three years, the local community for QT can grow as strong as like a, a small not small or relatively uh, small European country. So that's my hope. Yeah, Jason, I'm kind of curious. You want to you want to toss anything in for super secret tech for the Chinese players that Joe's brought along to run in their new their next couple tournaments, you know, a couple spicy things for the Angels of Death. I know you've got your Phobos tech, which anyone who's listening in China, if you understand English and you have listened to Phobos stuff, Jason loves talking Phobos, but he's got other he's got other tricks in his Astartes tool belt. Yeah, I mean, uh, Angels of Death, I haven't done nearly as much experimenting with, um, but I I do what I am trying to learn with the team and master is finding a high tempo way to play. So compressing the violence into a single turning point more than other teams want it to happen. So if if people have these cool once per turning point powers that are like the essence of their power. I think someone that is just like a good all around, they don't rely on their once per turn abilities quite as much like the angels of death. For example, you can just go sprinting into enemy lines with six space Marines that have chain swords and it'll be hard for people to deal with that. Just full blown dial the violence up to 11 full steam ahead. No brakes on the murder train chain swords going nuts. Um, I think that'll be amusing. I promise I'll do the manual translation for the tips Jason just made. As we, I, I personally paint, painting a Salamander Angel of Death army for, as I shared, uh, kill team for the game club, so all the new players can try to use them to learn for the learner rule. But as you, as you said, there's a good team with a huge depth in tactics and probably more potential to discover in the future meta. So it's a great team to get started and enjoy. It uh, is. Performance. Yeah, I think being able to overwhelm your opponents is really nice. Eventually, you know, players get to the point where they think they can hide for a little bit too long. And Jason is saying, if you run up six dudes to the midline on the next turn, nowadays the starties don't necessarily go down to a melt the gun shot necessarily. And plasma, definitely not. You just get to the midline and then just push on up into the back line and just commit ultra violence. On turn one, it might be a little bit too hard just because players don't really have a reason to go out on turn one. But if you aggressively stage against the stronghold walls or and make sure you're always touching heavy, one big tip for anyone playing in you know newer areas is your model should always be touching cover all the way smushed in. Or Jason will come around and the ghost of Jason will come and anti-obscure you from the other side of the map and blow you up. That's true. Um, there is a version, um, cause I love my skews. Um, I'm, I'm kind of toning that down a little bit, but, um, there's a version that worked well last edition and maybe once the other elites get toned down, it'll work well in this edition again, um, where you bring all 
long range threat intercessors, the, the space marines with rifles, and you stage insanely aggressively and you have engage orders on anyone. And then when enemies, when you run out of activations and people want to run up on you and shoot you with melted guns and things like that, your whole team is on engage. So when you counteract, you're going to be able to shoot back. And then it just makes it so that no one can safely approach your lines. That's great tips. <laughs> So uh, I think for elite, they are strong enough, and I think for even for new players, they can start to discover it. But especially for the guards-like teams with 10-plus uh, operatives, uh, this is quite a difficult part for the new community, especially uh, there are not enough player. players can discuss the tactics, uh, for example, the blooded or the uh, just broad brother, I think. Yeah, broad brother. Yeah. Uh, Things like that. So any tips for playing such uh, spam or not spam or the uh, yeah, like the horde. The common terminology is the horde. And the yeah. most important thing there is if players are committing to the ultra violence, you need to make sure that you're looking for ways to score points because you're not necessarily going to kill the marines. What you can do is focus on killing one or two of them, opening up a hole and finding a way to score. So it's looking very honestly at your tack ops and having a plan for doing those outside of just playing team deathmatch. Well, you know, just play team deathmatch, have fun with it and wait for them to get nerfed. It might take a couple months, but the goal is generally look at your tack ops and find a way to score them. So, yeah. For example, if you're playing uh, Pathfinders, Pathfinders can do recon and and uh, infiltration so my goal with them because i can kill people and i've got big guns is to kill one marine and get a confirmed marker or play secure beacons and basically line up on one side of the map and run away from the marines as i kill one or two of them as they try to push into my line so it's like overloading one side so don't just split all your models across the board focus on one like half of the board and run away from your marines and when they get too close pour 12 models worth of firepower into one dude as you back away slowly whether or not that's a, a good plan or just a plan that is up to you and the dice to figure out and that's part of the game yeah and the important thing is to have a plan before that rather than make a battle line with uh, even yeah. is really having, a plan, having a plan is the big part of that if you have no plan, then you're just going to get rolled because the Marines are very strong and they're easy to play right now. So don't go into it with no plan. Yeah, well, go back and write some plans for my commando because I picked the Ops. And the Commandos have an easy plan. I think that's the good thing about the Commandos is you've got the Grot and you've got Surveillance. So that is your backstop of a plan. So know that if you are playing on Volcus, there should be a spot on the map where you can run away from your opponent and hide a Grot. Right, Jason? Yeah. Yeah, and plus just like trying to put damage out without taking damage back and with your with your silent weapons, with your silent charging, um, there's opportunities for that. Stun grenades are good for that because if you can stage um, in heavy cover with a conceal order and throw a stun grenade, you'll kind of mess up the opponent's turn uh, and they can't hit you back for it. Um, and then if you uh, like another thing for anything that is a horde team and commanders would probably want to do this as well. If you if you send someone out as, as essentially as a missile, um, you want to move block the big threat. So if I if the Daka boy, for example, runs out and shoots an enemy elite space marine, uh, he's now standing in front of the space marine so that the space marine can't just run through him and kill your other valuable pieces behind him. He's trapped by the position of the Daka boy. Like he's going to have to shoot or he's going to have to charge into that boy and not the guys behind him. And one of the big goals for horde teams is you want to make sure that you get to do something before your opponent can kill it. So those asymmetric threats are what Jason has been trying to prioritize. Yeah. Yeah, and for uh, uh, the elite team, is a uh, kill as much as possible. <laughs> so for the for against the horde. So how about some insight for the uh, the uh, elite uh, against elite? So I try to watch the video for the New York Open to get everything understand understand back on their uh, tactical play. So but generally, what's the tactic or the strategy behind when a elite team plays against against an elite team during the uh, high tier match? I'll let Jason take that one because he was the one on stream. 
Yeah. Um, well, so I've mostly been playing Phobos, and I think the Phobos strike team does really well against other elites. Um, and that is because Phobos have a few amazing tools. A, a Reaver, for example, can jump onto a point that an enemy Space Marine is on and use the Terror Aura to just take the objective from them anyways. So that gives you really strong objective play. Um, and then the Incursors can ignore Obscuring. So you can shoot through angles where you can deal a lot of damage through like Incursors ignoring Obscuring. And if they shoot back, they're going to do hardly any damage, um, especially combined with Smoke Grenades. Um, that's, that's a pretty potent combo. Um, and then the most important tool on the team is actually the infiltrators with their Omni Scramble ability. And that is if an infiltrator can see an enemy, you can force them to delay their activation. So if you, if you have a melt gun run up in the middle of the board and it's staged in a way that he, you're definitely going to hit me f like as your first activation on the next turn. I'm going to use my Omni Scramble to freeze that guy in place, and now he has to be your third model to activate, and by then I can hopefully kill him before he even takes a shot. Oh, okay, then. So, so the key principle is that to leverage the strength of the team by each of the strong operative, so then make them then to combo as much as possible, so, right, for the Phobos. Because I just translated the Phobos today, <laughs> so yeah. I have much more clear uh, image about their, their tactics. There will be one uh, Phobos player who is very competitive in Saturday, on Saturday, mm -hmm. and both Sunday. So I will definitely make some translation for him for the tactical advice. Thank you for that. Yeah, the, the yeah, Phobos so, strike team is really interesting. Um, one of the okay. big things that a lot of people didn't notice um, is the the Vox Breaker operative can Omni Scramble people within six inches, even if he can't see them. Um, and then that is written into the Omni Scramble rule. It's not on the Vox Breaker's data card, so it's easy to miss. Yeah, it's very cool. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's always been some places of the, like the, if you don't read the uh, rules carefully, that will only miss the details such, such as sometimes we, you don't need the visibility. Mm -hmm. uh, like the plot marine, sometimes they just need to be within the seven inches. Sometimes they are, they are deep. Uh, they are, like, for example, the, I think that is the uh, uh, psychic uh, tricks can targeting a uh, op enemy op operative within friendly operatives control, uh, control range, such and such. So, yeah. Well, it will well take some time for the top tier players to figure out those tricks, but that is the uh, merit of, 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 of this game, or almost all the games Workshop's game. Mm -hmm. Phobos are very, very freaking cool. Especially play against the uh, teams that seem strong on the data card, but after, like James, as you said, you mentioned, play some nice tricks and combos, well, that is a great team to play, play mm -hmm. with. So the major issue is that, like, yeah, just one more question. Do you really play uh, in the tournament for the uh, correct weapons on your minis or you know, some flexibility for the serious game? Because even for Phobos, if you get a full armament, you need to at least, I think, two boxes with another spool of the... I can't remember the name. For the Reavers? The Reavers, yeah, third Marine in the, in, the, in, in the team. So what was the rules for the miniatures, poses, and uh, weapons for, for the for the U.S.? It varies by region, um, like especially with like more casual games, you can kind of get away with whatever you can you can get away with a lot as long as it's not confusing. I think Angels of Death is a good example because they have three different types of rifles. So you could just build one box of intercessors. And then as long as you say all of the rifles are auto bolt rifles or all of the rifles are stalker bolt rifles or all of the rifles are regular bolt rifles, it doesn't really matter what you have modeled as long as the way you play them is not confusing okay Kevin. so because there are so many teams that are because in the beginning of the tournament the organization i tried to ask my players to play uh i can't remember this uh, operation for the play uh all the uh, weapon correctly uh but uh, after i figured out there are so many especially for leaders there will be three combinations or even more combinations of weapons so yeah for my tournament i will choose to let them to use the correct operative, but feel free to uh, claim their weapon during the play. I think that can 
is the only way for teams like uh, Angel of Death because it's almost impossible to get all the, all the correct units. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as long as you're not having three models that look exactly the same be auto, stalker, and bolt rifle, then it doesn't really matter because it's generally easy enough to keep track of where things are. I think on the US side, and actually for a lot of places, we were using colored rubber bands for a long time in the last oh. edition for equipment and other stuff. And now I think that's a good way to distinguish really basic stuff. For example, Hearthkin Salvagers, because they have two different weapon profiles, you could say everyone with an orange is going to be ceaseless, and then everyone with a pink is going to be piercing one or piercing crits one. And it's an easy way to do that. And then if you have a piece of paper and you write it down and you give it to your opponent, that's just a as much information as possible and try to make it as clear as possible with the knowledge that maybe I don't want to have 40 models to play my 10 person skirmish army. Yeah. Yeah. I do agree. So, uh, because before you killed him, what surprised me was I haven't never played a game that assembled army during the, during the play. So I think for 2.0, that was a rule that you, you can bring a maximum of 20 operative to the, to the tournament. But so this, this rule, Am I correct? Is this rule this rule is not there for certain all? Which right, means it is different now. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. yeah, so for third edition that went away completely. Um I think the only team that has something a restriction that's kind of like that is angels of death with the chapter tactics and that is just like you choose your chapter tactics and you're stuck with that for the tournament but then the rest of the restrictions went away so inquisition for example could bring like 10 million models because you just have yeah. all of the different like support uh detachments that you can take um and then like the legionary now with all of their chaos marks um i think the the best way to do that is just have little tokens that's like say whether you're Nurgle, Corn, Slanesh, Zinch, or Undivided, and then like then you only need a few models and then you can just put tokens next to them and then switch the tokens between games to represent your chaos marks. Cause if you were gonna like paint them to represent like green marines or Nurgle, pink marines or Slanesh, then you would need to have like two hundred thousand chaos marines and that would just be craziness. There's no way for that complication. So we were curious how what, what is the tournament tournament look like in Nottingham? <laughs> Probably super interesting for them to have uh, everything to be correctly played as, as a rule. Uh, yeah, for, for my we do have two Inquisition players. They are super busy right now to going going to all the second hand <clears throat> platform to look for different types of types of minis. Uh, a guy is actually playing twenty teams to get all the Post corrected with the mini painting, so that is a super crazy for Inquisition playing, but it's quite enjoyable. So, uh, which is which is great. Yeah, big happy project that one. Yeah, I'll probably make some several video in in Chinese for the local local community for to introduce some easy uh, teams to get started with, and also looking for some advice from you. For example, the uh, Commando is a great team. You can assemble everything from one single box. The so Plot Marine definitely is because only six of them out of seven. Probably the the one with the big gun. You don't need it. To, to, you do not need it except the Into the Darkness. And also, I can't remember the name. The the B warrior for the Tau Tau Empire. They can uh you can get them from one single set of sprue. So those three things in my mind are quite uh. Good for new new beginners because they can save more money. But for the rest of them, multi boxes are probably needed. Yeah, I mean the new kill team starter kit that's coming out, uh, that just came out this weekend. By the time this podcast comes out, is actually a really good way to get into the game. You know, you and a friend split a box of marines. You both get a bespoke team. They're both pretty powerful and. For any aspiring conversion players, Angels of Death take conversions very easily because you can paint them as Imperial Fists. You can slap a Death Watch shoulder pad on them. You can switch their heads out with Reaver heads just to make them spooky people. All sorts of crazy things you can do. Yeah, that's a really good a great start. Or even for me as a player who has, haven't played for a for a while, it's quite really enjoyment to paint all them in the chapter color sets you, lo you love. And that is a great way to introduce to the new new players. The one, one, one tip I would like to have for new communities and new TOs, especially you are yourself, and not familiar with the game system, 
is that do not play vocals for the tutorial game. It's super complicated and difficult to remember all the detail. I have to say, every, every time I miss some of them for the vocals game, because especially I'm talking to a new player, oh, that is the second floor, which is higher than the other second floor. And in the, in the rule, they are treated as, as the same. <laughs> but so uh, the new starter box with the MDF term is super good for uh, tutorial play because you do not have vantage point, if I'm correct. To, to play, which I think the most complicated part in the rule understanding is about the vantage point and the conceal order and also the, the cover system. Those, the, the, that is the most difficult part. So the new starter boss is also a very good starting point to do the tutorial play because you are not going to use the complicated rules in Vulcans. You want to use the vantage. You can like treat them all as the heavy cover, so that will make everyone's life easier. So yeah, that's that, that's the one of the most important recommendations I can give to new uh, community contributors. Yeah, definitely agree. That starter train does look great. Yeah, but for MDF, they will bend if you are in a super dry area or area with high humidity. Just be aware. Yeah, I'm probably there actually in China, so <laughs> be aware if you are in like. Northern Europe or in South America, things will go wrong for the MDF for many times. All right. Well, I need to split. So, Joe, thanks for coming on to the Just Another Kill Team podcast where we connect Kill Team communities around the globe. And now we really have made it all the way around at least once. Yes, thanks for coming on. And thank you, listeners, for listening until the end.